Welcome back to Coding Shorts. I'm Sean Wildermuth. The last couple of weeks, I've been interviewing some people for some positions on some projects I'm running, and something really came to me. It seemed like universally the .NET developers I was talking with, with years and years of experience and ones who have had much less experience, all seem to be a little confused about how garbage collection and I disposable relate. So I thought I'd do a quick video here and just bring it up to speed. Now I've been doing .NET for over 20 years, so some of my ideas might be outdated, but I don't think they are. We'll actually see a running app and see how these things work with each other. Just a quick plug before we get started. I have another workshop coming on November 11th. It'll be Pragmatic Architecture for ASP.NET Core. We did one similar a couple months ago and went really well, so we're continuing it. In this workshop, I'll cover everything from very simple architecture and how to set up a project, all the way down to using Aspire to create your connected applications. If you're interested in this course, early bird pricing is still available until October 21st. You'll save $100 if you sign up before then. You can go ahead and look down in the show notes and there'll be a link over to the course. So let's talk about how the garbage collector works next. So here we have a really simple project. I've created just an ASP.NET worker project, add hosted service if you haven't used it yet. In the worker project, I'm doing something really simple. I'm just running this until a cancellation request comes in, and I'm just gonna create this new vector object. You can see I'm gonna be creating a ton of these objects. That's mostly so we can see some of the memory pressure. This whole class is here as a vector. It just stores an X and a Y and provides the ability to write it out. Super, super simple. And what seems to be confusing, let's go ahead and press F5, and I'm gonna use the diagnostic over here to sort of see. If we look at this graph right here, you'll see the memory footprint is staying at around 25, 26. We can actually see this in the counters for how much our working set is. And in the counters, we can actually see how many bytes were committed, what the heap size is. And you'll notice that'll go up and down as time goes. And then ultimately the little yellow thing is when the garbage collector hits. And then the memory of the heap goes way down because it's collected all of those different sources. And this is pretty usual. We're we're creating a lot of objects, and so this is sort of forcing the garbage collector to happen much more than you might think. This is simply how .NET works. This is a reference type, so it gets created on the heap and then collected once there's enough memory pressure to tell it, oh, you know what, we don't need those tens of thousands of objects, and it go ahead and clears the heap. So the garbage collector can actually see a couple of different things, generation zero, one, and two. And you can see these are of different sizes. The generation two size is the one that's kind of most long lived, but isn't really changing anything. The GC count until the garbage collector goes has a number of objects it needs to clear, and then the memory. And two doesn't really get affected much. There's a size there, but that isn't related to the actual number of counts that are there. And so you can see there are some objects that get moved into Gen 1. And Gen 0, Gen 1, and Gen 2 are really about how it organizes it. So for simple objects like our vector, they're going to be put in this Gen 0. And when they're collected, there's some something special about them. They have relationships to a lot of other objects. They might be promoted to the Gen 1 here. And the Gen 1 is going to be things that are less often going to be collected. They may live around longer than things we can just clear out immediately. And this is true for Gen 2 as well. You'll see Gen 2 is used very seldomly unless you have very large objects. There are certain things that can tell it to promote it to these different generations. But for the most part, when we're writing our code, we don't really have to think about that. But there are some things that come into practice that we're going to need to think about. So we come back to the code here. Let's go ahead and put an I disposable on this. And we're going to create a really simple dispose pattern, basically just a method that gets called. And what is this dispose for? This is an important idea, and that is this is for unmanaged resources. Now, what the heck does that mean? In C .NET, your memory is managed for you. So this isn't for clearing up menus, setting nulls to objects, or any of that stuff you might want to think about to try to help it do its job. These are for things like database connections, file handles, and sockets. Things that aren't memory, but are things that we want to make sure we close and flush and all of those before we get rid of them. And when I say file handles, it also means that if I'm using something that is iDisposable, it'll be up to me to call dispose on that. So if I had a, let's say, db connection, 
Let's pretend I had it and pretend that I'm using it in some place. Then it's my responsibility when my object goes out of scope, assuming you're not using this very locally, to say dispose as well. So anytime you're using things that support I disposable, you need to make sure that you need, can close them as well. Again, unless you're using them within the scope of a single function and using the using clause. One of the confusions I got about this is that there was some relationship between the garbage collector and I disposable. And frankly, there isn't. So let's show you this. I don't have to change any of this code because I'm not going to handle dispose. But when my class gets run, we're going to see the same things we saw before. This is going to go up and then eventually the heap, all these objects will be collected. You can see that happening here. Are we stopping in dispose? No, the garbage collector knows nothing about dispose. Oh, again, remember the garbage collector is about managing your memory. I disposable is about managing resources that aren't memory. And that's an important distinction here. There's no proof that we're gonna need this and that these things are actually going to be let go. So let's stop this for a minute and let's go ahead and put a using clause on our object. And all that using does is say, once this goes out of scope, which will happen pretty quickly because this is a tight loop, it will go ahead and call dispose. So let's see if that actually works. Yep. Immediately we get a call for dispose and we were to unclick this and run it. We'll see that our application works pretty much the same as it had. We have a bunch of objects and eventually they're collected. Now the disposal just means that we may clean up resources that we have to manage on our own because they're class level variables. But this sort of implies a problem. So let's stop for a second. And I kind of told you that I'm using this naive version of iDisposable. Let's go ahead and comment that out. I'll leave this so you can download the source later. And we can actually implement this with what's called a dispose pattern. So what a dispose pattern does is it has a value here that says, have we disposed it yet? And so it's just keeping track whether dispose was called on this object. And then when dispose is called, it's going to see if it hasn't been disposed yet and it is disposing, then here we would put our connection dispose. And then after that, it gets disposed. And this is where you can do sort of things that you care about. And there's two things interesting. This is actually the interface being implemented. And it does two things. One, it says, go ahead and call the dispose. And when we're done, assuming we've disposed this object, we can suppress finalize. Now, this is actually something we don't need yet because we don't have a finalizer. Now, a lot of developers may not be familiar with the finalizer. It's rarely used and it really has some key moments to it. And this commented out code is a finalizer. We'll come back to that in just a second. I just want to show you that this, in fact, still runs the same. We get garbage collection. We're still creating GC counts of one, all that's good. Let's stop that. And what happens if we go ahead and use this finalizer? Now, what is a finalizer? Finalizer is the opposite of a constructor. In other languages, they call it a destructor, but it's called a finalize on purpose. This means that this is the final code that will be executed when your object is about to be collected. So it is to allow you to do things to make sure it's never collected. To allow you to do things like call dispose here, allows you to call this code and say, let's dispose it in case someone didn't handle it correctly, this finalizer being the final thing that's executed, we'll make sure that we actually dispose it. And this is pretty common for I disposable. But then we come back to this other piece that I commented out, suppressed finalize. The suppressed finalize is there on purpose, is actually calling what? The GC, the garbage collector itself saying, this thing doesn't need to call its finalizer because someone called dispose correctly. It's only up here when it's being cleaned up by the garbage collector will this actually be. And so the relationship is on the finalizer, not I disposable. Again, the garbage collector knows nothing about I disposable. We're just creating these to be helpful. Use the same code and things don't look a lot different because we're guaranteeing that finalization is being called in every case. Everything looks normal because we've supported that and we're using the using statement right here. But let's stop it for a minute. And what if we forgot to put the using on? Let's just get rid of that for a minute. Now, what are we seeing? We're seeing the size of this heap balloon by huge amounts. And you can see all these little yellow pieces. Because it's not being called during the normal reaction, we're actually saying this dispose is being called. And because of this, it's delaying it. In fact, we can see that gen one counts is very similar to the gen zero counts here. And that's really because we're calling the garbage collector a ton of times and slowing down our 
current application because of it. Otherwise, this would balloon to enormous amounts. What is going on here? This is the cost of using the finalizer. So if someone isn't doing it and you absolutely have to make sure they dispose of it, you're going to get this really bad behavior if they haven't done it. And so this is only used in very rare cases where you have something that absolutely has to change. Now, I see this used occasionally. I'm going to comment it out because generally I don't think you should use it. The only times I've really seen it used, it was abused. Remember, this is about freeing unmanaged resources. And what I see people sometimes use is this is supposed to do things like, oh, this user has logged off or this other operation. And it's important here because if you use this finalizer and this finalizer ends up increasing the amount of memory, which can happen. Let's say you were going to say, oh, this user is going out of scope. Therefore, I want to make sure that I write to the database that they've logged out. As soon as it sees that go up, it'll just destroy the object. This is especially on shutdown. So if you have an application like in WPF or in WinForms or when your server is coming down on ASP.NET, if the finalizer is being called during exit start to go up, it just destroys the whole heap and closes. That way you don't get stuck in this loop of having those finalizers call. So don't use it for anything other than releasing unmanaged resources. It can be cute to say, oh, this using statement really helps me. Make sure that they've done it, right? And using the using statement's fine, but as soon as you involve the finalizer, things can get ugly really quickly. So make sure you have an incredibly good reason for this. Like you don't want to leave database connections open, for example. So for the most part, depending on what you're writing, most of those resources will be handled. And one of the interesting things that is important is the garbage collector doesn't care about iDisposable, but guess what does? The service host. So if you're using the built-in service host and most of the other third-party dependency injection libraries, when they get shut down, will register which ones have an iDisposable and call the disposable for you. So if you have long or short-run services you're going to add that have iDisposable, you don't need to create some magic mechanism to dispose them. The dependency injection layer will do that for you. But let's come back to our example here real quick, because the other thing that this sort of implies, and I'm going to comment out some of this code that we built for iDisposable, is remember if we don't have iDisposable, and of course we can't use using there, and we run this, we'll get back to our old behavior, building up a small amount, and when it hits some pressure point, it'll go ahead and release all those, and all of these objects in Gen 0 will get cleaned. But here's the thing. I know a lot of you understand the difference between reference and value type, but this is where it can get really useful for your application to not use it. So let's come down here and let's change our class here to a record. Any real change? No, because a record is a reference type. You might see it go a little longer, but that is more about enabling small data-only classes as well as dealing with change in a sane way. But what if we were to make this a struct? I know a lot of you are saying, I know what this is. Remember, I'm creating a ton of these, but when we look at it, our memory is a lot lower and the GC isn't being involved at all. That's because a struct being a value type, just like an integer, is created locally on the stack. And as soon as it goes out of scope, it just disappears. The stack is destroyed in that frame and you go about your business. So even though we're creating the same number, our memory footprint is much lower and the need for garbage collection actually goes away because we're not adding all that pressure of creating objects and destroying them because the stack are value types. And if we do the same thing here and say, well, maybe I want it to be a record, you can also set it up as a record struct. So you get that immutability that you may be looking for in records or dealing with just data values, but it will be created as a struct instead. So we have that same behavior, even though it's a record. So that's important to know when you want to use some of these values. So where does that leave us? My hope here is that most C-sharp developers can gain a very service level understanding of how the GC works, and more importantly, how creating your classes can impact how it works. This means not everything needs to be a class. iDisposable can be used in a very sane way to do cleanup specifically of unmanaged resources. What it's really allowing us to do is say, I need some things cleaned up that aren't memory, and I want to do it as soon as I can by using the using statement on iDisposable disposable that becomes simple for you. Make sense? So thanks for joining me for this coding short. My name is Sean Wildermuth. I'll see you next time.